Hello, my name is Kenneth Liu. I'm an associate professor of neurological surgery at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. I specialize in endovascular and open vascular neurosurgery. And today I will be speaking on intracranial venous denting. Venous compression syndromes are caused by a restriction in venous outflow, resulting in upstream congestion and tissue dysfunction. While the true incidence of these entities is unknown, they are becoming increasingly recognized throughout the body. Extra axial examples include may thurner syndrome, or compression of the left iliac vein by the right common iliac artery, thoracic outlet syndrome, or compression of the subclavian vein, and nutcracker syndrome, or compression of the left renal vein by the superior mesenteric artery. In this presentation, I will be using cases, several cases, to illustrate various examples of venous compression syndromes of the central nervous system. It is important to understand that the heterogeneity in clinical presentations can often confound the diagnos diagnostic process for these patients. The first case is a 30-year-old otherwise healthy woman who presents with severe headaches and double vision. Her past medical history is non-contributory. On neurologic exam, she is noted to have bilateral abducens nerve palsies, visual field deficits, and papilledema. These photographs clearly illustrate the patient's inability to properly abduct her, both of her eyes on lateral gaze. There's also medial deviation noted on forward gaze. Formal visual field testing demonstrates bilateral visual field deficits and phonoscopic examination demonstrates florid papilledema with evidence of retinal hemorrhaging. Her intracranial non-invasive imaging was read as normal with no evidence of mass or hydrocephalus. Given her clinical presentation, our concern was that she harbored elevated intracranial pressures and an invasive intracranial pressure monitor was placed, revealing an opening pressure of 68 millimeters of mercury, with normal being less than 20. This patient represents an extreme case of pseudotumor cerebri, otherwise known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. These patients tend to be young and predominantly female, and there is a strong association with obesity. These patients suffer from bifrontal unrelenting pressure headaches, typically worse in the mornings, and complain of blurry vision. Papilledema is often noted on fundoscopic examination. In patients with elevated intracranial pressure, non-invasive imaging is useful to rule out the presence of a mass lesion or hydrocephalus. This is typically done with CT imaging or MR imaging. Interestingly, in many of these patients, non-invasive studies are often interpreted as normal by inexperienced physicians. On closer examination, one can notice subtle findings on some of the neuroimaging. Flattening of the pituitary gland, while a nonspecific finding, can be, an, can be evidence of increased intracranial pressure. In addition, downward displacement of the cerebellar tonsils can be noticed as well. The ventricular system is often smaller than average in volume. On axial T2 imaging, thickening and kinking of the optic nerve sheaths can be noticed, as well as excess fluid signal around the optic nerves. In severe cases, flattening of the globes and elevation of the optic disc can be seen. In cases where venous compression is noted, non-invasive vascular imaging can be used to help with the diagnosis. In this patient's case, an MR venogram demonstrates a focal point of stenosis at the junction of the transverse and sigmoid sinus on the left. If left untreated, elevated intracranial pressures can produce neurologic deficits and eventually lead to blindness. As such, treatment is often directed at lowering the intracranial pressures to prevent these deficits from becoming permanent. Medical treatment typically involves weight loss and the use of acetazolamide, a carbonic anhydrous inhibitor, which is thought to slow the rate of CSF production. Surgical therapy is often directed at diverting CSF from the central nervous system with the use of a shunt. If additional decompression is needed, optic nerve sheath fenestration can be used to help preserve vision. In cases such as this one, where vascular venous compression is suspected, the aforementioned therapies only serve as band-aids and do not address the underlying problem. For this case, venous outflow reconstruction with endovascular stent placement is the 
optimal choice. Once a stenosis is suspected, this can be confirmed with formal invasive catheter angiography. Catheter angiography is important for two reasons. First, it can be used to rule out rare life-threatening vascular lesions such as brain arteriovenous malformations and duro arteriovenous fistulae that can produce venous hypertension. Second, once these lesions are ruled out, it is important to measure the degree of flow restriction uh, by measuring the physiologic pressures across the stenosis. This is performed by navigating a microcatheter into the venous anatomy and measuring intravascular pressures, both proximal and distal, to the stenosis. In this patient's case, a gradient or pressure difference of 51 mill millimeters of mercury is noted. This large gradient is suggestive of severe physiologic flow limitation, analogous to the density of vehicles on a freeway before and after a crash. Given the patient's symptoms and vascular stenosis, the patient elected to proceed with endovascular stent placement. This set of digitally subtracted images demonstrates before and after pictures from her procedure. In addition to restoration of the caliber of the blood vessel, the physiologic gradient that was measured prior to stent placement was completely obliterated. This set of AP and lateral x-ray images demonstrates the placement of the stent in the left transverse sinus. Because this patient had a pressure monitor in situ, we were able to monitor her intracranial pressures throughout the procedure. Measurement of her ICPs demonstrated normalization within 60 seconds after stent placement. More importantly, at her three-month follow-up, the, patient, the patient's visual fields had essentially returned to normal, and her papilledema had resolved. In addition, her extraocular movements have returned to normal as well. In selected patients, the use of venous denting to treat intracranial hypertension has been shown to be safe and effective. This particular manuscript examines the use of stenting to treat intracranial hypertension in patients with vascular venous compression with a con concomitant use of invasive pressure monitoring. The study showed that stents were able to completely normalize the intracranial pressures for every patient in the study. There were no major complications. The scientific literature is also now replete with studies demonstrating and confirming that the complication rate of, this, of venous denting procedures are exceedingly low, that the long-term patency of the stents remains very high, and that the clinical outcomes are durable. The second case is a 39-year-old woman who presents with headaches and a whooshing noise in her left ear. The whooshing noise which she described as tinnitus, was loud enough and drove her crazy. It made it impossible for her to have conversations and use the phone. Her past medical history is otherwise non-contributory. Non-invasive imaging demonstrates a normal appearing eighth cranial nerve complex on the left side in the upper right-hand corner. Further examination of her MRI demonstrates the radiographic stigmata of elevated intracranial pressures. Again, this is demonstrated by a flattened pituitary gland on the sagittal MRI image on the left, as well as excess CSF signal within the optic nerve sheaths on T2 imaging in the lower right. Non-invasive vascular imaging demonstrates signal dropout in both of her transverse sinuses, and cath this is confirmed with catheter angiography. Her left dominant transverse sinus is shown to have a stenosis with a 15 millimeter mercury pressure gradient. She was offered stenting and elected to proceed. This image, this image demonstrates successful stent placement of the left transverse sinus, and the patient noted that upon awakening from the procedure, her tinnitus had completely disappeared. The next case is a 31-year-old obese female who presents with blurry vision, headaches, and what she thought was spinal fluid leaking from her nose. She is otherwise healthy and her past medical history is also non-contributory. On neuro neurologic examination, uh, she is non-focal. A CT cisternogram demonstrates active leakage of contrast through the cribriform plate into the nasal cavity, likely from elevated intracranial pressures. 
Her venous compression is confirmed with a catheter angiogram demonstrating severe stenosis in the right transverse sinus associated with an 11 millimeter pressure gradient. After a stent was placed in the right transverse sinus, her pressure gradient was eliminated and she was able to be discharged the following day. She noted that her CSF leak resolved on its own within about a week or two. The next case involves a young 22-year-old graduate student uh, who suffered with headaches and was failing her classes in school. She likened her symptoms to early dementia, as is often seen in older patients. Her past medical history is non-contributory, and aside from moderate word-finding difficulty and memory problems, her neurologic exam is non-focal. On, on non-invasive vascular imaging, she's noted to have stenosis of the proximal segment of her, of her superior sagittal sinus, which is a, a, rare area to, a rare area to develop stenosis. This is confirmed with catheter angiography where a six millimeter gradient is detected. She elected to undergo stent placement, as you can see here, with obliteration of her gradient. It should be noted that, that the following day, within 24 hours of the procedure, the patient already noted that her brain felt clearer and she's able to fly home the following day. At her six month follow-up, her, her symptoms had completely resolved. Her headaches had disappeared, her cognitive decline had improved, and she was able to finish her graduate degree without further difficulty. The fifth case involves a 46-year-old female high-function executive who in addition to complaining of severe headaches and dystonia was also experiencing symptoms of cognitive decline that were interfering with her work. Given the, the dystonia and, the, and the, early, the signs of early dementia, she was thought to have a variant of Parkinson's disease. Vascular imaging suggested the presence of stenosis in the straight sinus, which is the dural sinus connecting the vein of Galen to the torcula of herophilus. This is confirmed with a catheter angiogram demonstrating a large gradient of 10 millimeters of mercury. Given this finding, the patient elected to undergo stent placement, uh, as you can see here. Interestingly, at six month follow-up, her headaches and her cognitive decline had all but disappeared. In addition, her dystonia had disappeared as well. It is hypothesized that stenosis in the deep venous system resulted in mild congestion of her diencephalic and mesencephalic structures mimicking a movement disorder. The last case is a 17-year-old star soccer athlete who had struggled with headaches for most of her life, but within, with, within the past one year developed progressive weakness of her arms and her legs. She underwent an extensive imaging workup focused on her spinal cord and her brain, and all were read as negative. Unfortunately, she was eventually diagnosed with fictitious disorder and referred for psychiatric evaluation. Her mother refused to believe her daughter was pretending and continued to seek medical attention. Non-invasive vascular imaging in this patient's case demonstrates a critically stenosed right internal jugular vein at the level of the C1 vertebra. Her left internal jugular vein is hypoplastic and thus this critically stenotic and narrowed right inter internal jugular vein represent, represents the sole venous outflow for her entire brain. This stenosis was confirmed with catheter angiography and a gradient of three millimeters of mercury was detected. It's important to note the presence of enlarged venous collaterals surrounding uh, the area of stenosis. The patient elected to go stent placement as you can see here. In addition to restoring the normal caliber of the vein, one can notice the almost instantaneous resolution in the presence and size of the enlarged venous collaterals. It is hypothesized that because of the critical stenosis, parasitization of the perivertebral venous plexus by the brain caused a mild congestive vasculopathy of the high cervical cord, mimicking a transverse myelitis. After restoration of normal flow, uh, the patient experienced a brisk neuro neurologic recovery. Within 24 hours, she was walking independently again, and within 48 hours, she was running on a treadmill. In conclusion, 
it is important to note that these patients can be difficult to diagnose. In contrast, strokes from arterial occlusions have consistent, well-characterized symptoms defined by the affected vascular territory. Venous compression syndromes, on the other hand, tend to be ill-defined entities that can have vague and variable clinical presentations between patients. Without a high index of clinical suspicion and appropriate imaging, these patients can be easily misdiagnosed or worse, labeled with a psychiatric diagnosis. Once identified, venous compression syndromes of the nervous, central nervous system can be safely and effectively treated with minimally invasive endovascular stent placement.